Just take a minute to reconnect with your motivation. Okay, hi everybody. Nice to see you. Last time we were talking about guru yoga and um, and then the meditation was to look at the Lama Tsongkhapa guru yoga practice, either the short straight version or the one with the extensive rejoicing. Were you guys able to do that before class or some of you still not gotten to it yet? Some, yes, some got to it. <laughs> it's all right. Um, it's, it's more just, uh, it'll be easier to explain if you already have gone through it, but it's okay. If you haven't, you can do it later. Um, just from our discussion on Monday, and um, if those of you have done it already, did you have some, some thoughts about the process? Um, this idea of the Guru and Buddha being inseparable, and also inseparable from your own nature, and uh, kind of getting into that harmony? And harmonization process how is the whole premise sit with you so the idea that um, <clears throat> you think about Maitreya the Buddha of loving kindness the holder of the teachings on Buddha nature kind of in his pure land in his heaven and then from his heart comes Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples the very important teachers of the 14th century from their hearts come a tube of white light goes to the crown of your head flushes through you as you say the mantra and um, helps you bring all the realizations of the path and kind of awaken your own inner guru. Um, that's the process, right, in a nutshell. And there's these other elements of, you know, taking a minute to confess, taking a minute to rejoice, um, you know, these other kind of religious sounding elements, but basically the idea being the inner guru and the outer guru need to be in harmony with one another, in collaboration and unity with one another. And the outer guru and the Buddha are in collaboration and harmony with each other. And from the tantric point of view, are kind of one and the same, depending on which commentary you read and which teacher you ask. They either are the same or they're as if the same because the Buddha is there in the place that that teacher occupies. So. However you view it, it's a bit nuanced, but the whole premise, um, what do you think? Very, quite different from the Sutra perspective, which is more in alignment with, you know, worldly wisdom about mentorship and stuff like that. Yeah, Karina? Can you elaborate a little bit about the, uh, the difference between the two things that you said? The Sutra guru and the Tantra guru, or? The two kinds of, uh, is it the same or? as if the same. Oh, the two views of the Tantra Guru, yeah. So Sutra Guru, we did a lot of conversation on, we get it, I think, generally, but you can ask if you have other questions come up. The Tantra Guru, there are, um, there are a number of schools of thought about how to practice Guru Yoga in the Tantric way, 
in relation to your physical, real human being teacher. One school of thought says that your real human being, physical teacher that you have in interactions with, that you've taken refuge from, that you've taken bodhisattva vows from, that you've taken tantric vows from, that once that process has been established, that teacher is Guru Vajadhara, or the, the tantric manifestation of all the Buddha's energy. That literally, that everything that that guru does and says from the point of commitment onward is directly, specifically, actions of the Buddha for you. Not just a way of thinking or a nice attitude to adopt so that you hear things more deeply, but literally. So that's one school of thought. Um, that's the school of thought of our teacher, Lama Zoba Rinpoche. Um, and that means anything that the guru you've committed to does is enlightened. And any faults that you see are your own karmic obscurations. Maybe you guys would say are your own projections, um, but your own karmic obscurations, your own negative karma ripening, and the fact that your karma isn't pure enough to see the full supreme Nirmanakaya aspect of the Guru Buddha. So you might see faults, but those faults are due completely to your own karma and nothing to do with the being who you see the faults on. So that's one tantric view. The other tantric view is that this person that you've chosen as your tantric guru is like the gateway to the Dharmakaya or the gateway to Vajradhara, the tantric manifestation of all the Buddhas, and that you access that energy, that wisdom energy via the gateway of this person. But this person, their qualities are not, you can't be certain of, and so you think that they are a perfect doorway, but not necessarily a perfect being. But when you're on your meditation cushion, doing your tantric practice, you still adopt the idea that they are perfect and that you know they're the manifestation of the Buddha for you. But then when you're out and about, thinking about them, having a cup of tea with them, I don't know, fighting over carrot cake, like I do with mine, <laughs> you know, that those interactions, you can think that any fault that you see in the guru in an ordinary way are still, you know, related to your projections and related to your karmic obscurations, but they could also be that they, there is an affliction present in that being. And that doesn't negate the fact that still they are the perfect gateway to the divine for you. So there's two tantric views. One is more literal than the other. Um, the very literal, um, some might say fundamentalist view, um, also has a great deal of transformative properties, to be fair. There is huge energy and bliss that comes from absolute subservience, that comes from complete giving over of responsibility, that comes from uh, complete merging with the idea that everything this person says and do, does is good and for my benefit, there's a bliss in that kind of surrender. And some people live their whole life practicing that way and have huge benefit. And some people live their whole life practicing that way and become fanatics and become fundamentalist um, and can become quite rigid. Um, some people practice that way and can become uh, full of doubts that they don't look at. And so there's a kind of uh, cognitive dissonance and a kind of inner turmoil. Um, so this more extreme view, it's, it's got a lot of benefits and it's got a lot of disadvantages. Um, the more, I don't know, I would say the more logical view, which is that after having made this commitment with this person, they become the gateway to the divine for you. It, it feels a little bit more functional, but that's just my personal opinion. So which view is correct or which view works for you? That's actually a huge conversation that, that requires a lot of thought and um, teachers far more advanced and realized than, than me. So my personal opinion is that it's far less fraught to be less literal. Yeah. Does the distinction make sense? So I'm talking about the tantric guru in both of those contexts, but there's two different views of how to approach the tantric guru. All right. So, you know, there's, there's interesting stories in modern era of, for example, um, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche, the head of the Shambhala tradition, who is Pema Chodron's main teacher, right? You guys know about Pema Chodron. She wrote, you know, When Things Fall Apart and The Wisdom of No Escape, and she's an amazing nun who lives in Canada. 
So her teacher was, um, he was a nutcase, right? Like a brilliant, fascinating nutcase. He was an alcoholic. He was a womanizer. He was completely eccentric, right? And all of this was branded as crazy wisdom, right? Crazy wisdom. If you read anything by Chugim Trimpa, it is brilliant. Like he was a brilliant writer. He wrote the seminal text, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. He wrote my favorite book on the five Buddha families, which is Wisdom Without Goal. Amazing writer. His actual behavior was completely dodgy, completely out of sync with ethics. Um, it was really almost a little bit culty. But the, the thing that made it less problematic is that everyone knew, right? All of his students knew that he behaved this way. And so it wasn't a shock or a surprise when he manifested these behaviors. And they all took on board the idea that they would still see all those behaviors and activities as enlightened guidance specifically for them. And many Shambhala students are amazing practitioners. So even if you get a crazy wisdom guru with totally dodgy ethics, you can still progress if your mind is in the right synchronization. There's the other side, which is teachers like uh, Sogil Rinpoche, who wrote the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying and is the founder of the Rigpa organization. His students did not know <laughs> that he was a womanizer, abusive, financial abuse, you know, like all the like classic, like culty guru yucky stuff that you can imagine, like so dodgy, right? So dodgy. But his students didn't know. His students thought that he was showing the aspect of being a completely perfect, pure, ethical being. And then cracks began to show in the organization when he hurt lots of students. And eventually the truth came out and there was a big eruption and a big schism in the community. So just my own opinion is that you can work with crazy wisdom gurus if you know they are crazy wisdom gurus <laughs> and they are out about being crazy wisdom gurus and there's an open conversation and transparency about that uh, what what my own personal opinion is is that if they are concealing that and it manifests out of sync with ethics that that is too dangerous and too hard for our minds to cope with without huge cognitive dissonance you guys would understand all of that much easier than most Dharma students that I have to have this conversation with because you get it about projection. But it's, it's interesting to kind of sit with. Yeah, and of course there are tons of tantric gurus who have beautiful ethics, who are, you know, absolutely reliable and lots of amazing work can get done with them. But to assume that someone is pure just because they have the tag Rinpoche is naive. So anyway, fun facts, <laughs> fun facts about the dark side. But we know that any place in the world where there is power, there will be people who abuse power, right? It's human nature. Yeah. So it's nothing to do with the Dharma. It's just human nature, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Rona, did you have something or Bahali? Uh, yes. I, I wanted, I'm still, uh, did, I don't understand still the other kind of uh, the Tanta Gu. Uh, when there are faults, that it's not uh, my projection, the view about it, I didn't understand. S say your question again. I didn't understand the other kind of view about the Tantra Guru, when there are faults, that uh, you say that it's like affliction presents of in this moment, it's not projections. That you, yeah, that you, yeah. I if you can elaborate it, I, I'm still, I don't understand it enough. The other kind yeah, it's, of view. Um, what, you're, what you're doing in one case is to see all negativity or bad behavior of the guru as your own projection, you know? Okay. But they are not bad, they are absolutely perfect. Everything they do is perfect, even if they hit you on the head, even if they rape you, even if they steal all your money, everything they do is perfect, literally. And if you see any of those behaviors, that is just your karmic obscurations. That is just your lack of merit. And you need to view it in a transformative way. That's the literal full on view. The other view is that you're able to see that this person who you've chosen as your 
tantric guru might have faults, they might have, um, you know, human negativities. And that doesn't negate the fact that still you can access the divine, perfect, pure Buddhas through them as a gateway by adopting a certain view. Right, so you can think, oh, you know, they're tired and grumpy today. That doesn't necessarily have to be my projection. They might actually be tired and grumpy that day. They don't actually have to be enlightened for me to access enlightenment through them. Uh, okay. Right, the other view is they have to be enlightened for me to access enlightenment through them. Yeah. So there are two different views of the same tantric idea, and it's something that there's a lot of... Um, disagreement, debate, discussion about. And at the end of the day, you ask yourself what works for you on your cushion to actually have that heart open, inspirational feeling of connection with a personified version of the Buddha. You know, the Buddha that you can relate to, not just this picture, you know, but an actual relationship that is going to help your mind achieve perfection and development. Yeah, so for some people, I mean, I'm sure we've met them, there may be, um, right, are there certain dispositions that are very authoritarian and do well with strict authority figures? And, you know, I have friends who, if Lama Zopa Rinpoche tells them, do 500,000 prostrations, they will do 500,000 prostrations joyfully, blissfully, and feel so satisfied afterward and go through an amazing transformation because of it. And they're doing it literally because he told them to. You know, there's some people that really develop very quickly and beautifully that way. And there are some people for whom that is quite problematic and there needs to be more dialogue and discussion and collaboration about their life choices. Yeah, so, you know, I have teachers of both types, myself personally. I have very extremist teachers and I have very modern teachers and, um, you know, sometimes the, you will ask the same question to both teachers and they will give you contradictory advice. And how do you resolve that? You have to awaken the inner guru, you know? And so the guru disciple relationship is fraught, right? It is really complicated. And what are you actually relating to? You know, in any of the contexts, even the sutra context, what are you exactly relating to? You know, what is more than just your own mind? Are you just yelling into an echo chamber? Or is there something that you're relating to outside of yourself? It's, it's a very interesting question to explore. What are the, you know, ingredients for inspiration and change like we talked about on Monday? But these processes that we go through in Guru Yoga, it's, it's tapping into something different and deeper, but also something more dangerous. The second uh, guru version yeah. means that he's not a Buddha. It means you don't know, and it doesn't matter if you know. Yeah, but, but if you believe he's a, a gate, but he has some faults, he, he can't be a Buddha if, he, if it's true, right? You're not, you're not landing on it so definitively. You're saying, I might see faults. It could be that they are not a Buddha, and they have those faults. And it could be that I'm just projecting my own faults on someone else. And it actually doesn't even matter because they fulfill the characteristics and criteria for being that gateway for me. So you're not saying definitely they're not a Buddha. You're just saying they don't have to be a Buddha for it to work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, when you get into hardcore Buddhist communities, this becomes a very emotional conversation with a lot of, you know, policy implications that are complicated, as you would imagine, right? So it's, it's something worth knowing about and talking about, but in terms of your own personal practice, you're just asking, what is the wisest way to engage with the external world that will bring about inspiration and transformation? You know, how much surrender is healthy for me? What type is healthy for me? You know, uh, what sort of, inner structures facilitate change. You know, these, these are really personal issues and questions. Um, 
some, some forms of Buddhism don't even look for their teachers when they die, right? This whole process of recognizing reincarnated lamas, like the 14th Dalai Lama or the 17th Karmapa or the 7th Ling Rinpoche, this is very Tibetan, right? Um, other traditions assume that if you have a strong karmic connection with someone, like student and teacher, you'll keep bumping into them. You don't have to force it, right? You don't have to hunt for them. You don't have to name them. Um, they'll be reborn intentionally because of the power of their mind. People will think they're an amazing precocious child. Hopefully they will meet good training and be able to become an amazing teacher again, but they don't orchestrate it in the same way as the Tibetan tradition. Um, the Tibetan tradition thinks it's really efficient to find the reincarnation of previous teachers so that you can put them into training right away so you don't waste time waiting for them to grow up and becoming amazing teachers. You put them right into the monastery when they're five or six years old and start their training right away so that they can start teaching in their early 20s or late teens. And, you know, that's nice for their students who have been waiting for 20 years for them to grow up. You know, <laughs> so there's, you know, the Tibetan system and the Chinese system, for example, have, have different ways of viewing the hunt for the teacher as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, do with that information what you will. <laughs> Questions? Is it uh, a plausible possibility that uh, a guru decided in the brackets to to manifest uh, himself in an aspect of a fault behavior in order to, to make me as a, as a disciple to practice something special for me? Yes, yeah, definitely. Definitely, they know our karmic disposition, they know our you know, faults and our qualities and they might orchestrate the appearance of a fault specifically for a specific training for us. And when you're in the more literal, literal mindset, that's the way you're supposed to think. If you're not in the literal mindset, if you're in the more expansive, I don't know who this being is or what this being is, but it still works, you can still try to think that way and think, well, if the Buddha is manifesting in this way, say they're shouting at me, you know, what is this saying to me about my own tendencies to shout? You know, or they're showing the aspect of greed and that doesn't seem enlightened at all. Maybe they have no greed whatsoever, but they're showing me the fault of it so I can see it in front of me and then look at myself more deeply. So definitely that's, that's part of the training in one school of thought is to assume that if you see dramatic bad behavior, that it could be a divine plan specifically to wake you up about a specific fault that you have. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it's a, an amazing, useful training if you can do it. And, you know, it's a little bit complicated depending on the appearance. Yeah. Yeah, and you could see the recipe for disaster. I'm sure all of you are worldly human beings who have seen any number of documentaries, heard any number of stories, maybe gone through any number of processes yourself, and you know how this could get really weird really quickly. Um, but I think what saves us is the spirit of inquiry and the spirit of debate is encouraged in all forms of Buddhism. And so if you're arguing, it's not like you're going to be locked away or punished or anything like that. You know, some communities might be less functional than others, but the spirit of inquiry and debate is alive and encouraged built into the religion. So it's not like you suddenly say you can't question it when it comes to this one topic, you know? So you're allowed to argue and ask and check, but it is part of the reason why there is so much emphasis given on checking the guru, because any view you take of the guru, if they are uh, showing the aspect of being perfectly ethical, any form of the guru yoga practice will be really useful. You know, if they show the aspect of perfect ethics, great, easy, right? But there's a prayer that says, even if the guru criticizes, provokes, or ignores me, I will be like a dog without anger, never responding with anger. I'll be like a ferry boat, never upset at any time to come and go for the guru. You know, there's these very much um, subordinate, subjugating, surrendering ideas, which have great power, and great danger. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> it's very tricky. So, um, yeah, <laughs> what's not? I wonder if a, if a teacher has his view about like which view do you like what is um more precise in his view to take of a guru does it mean that he's rigid or narrow or it's like natural that each teacher has his own view about the relationship yeah, it's, I mean, before you take a teacher, it's good to find out what their view is, for sure. But they, it's very rare for them to tell you how to view them. So they will tell you their view of the guru-disciple relationship. They will tell you their view of guru yoga and use examples of their teachers. Then they won't then turn around and say, therefore, you and me, you should think of me this way. They won't do that, right? Because they're always going to flick off any sense of them having realizations or qualities. You know, they're going to say, I'm not enlightened. I have no realizations. They'll insist on that, right? All good teachers will insist that they have no good qualities, right? Like His Holiness says, I'm just a simple monk. No, he's not. He's Chen Rezig, the Buddha of compassion, who looks like a simple monk and acts like a simple monk. But, you know, he's, he's, he's more than that and that. Right? So the teacher um, won't tell you how to view them, but you can assume how they would like that to play out by how they talk about their own teachers. Yeah. And, you know, the more kind of, I, I am branding it as tight and rigid and fundamentalist and literal, that is me and my branding and my projections and my baggage, right? So the people that actually practice in that way really amazing transformation has come of that. And they wouldn't call it that, obviously. They would call it the pure view, right? They would call it the pure view. And there's huge benefits in the pure view. And it's only really my own personal experience with having been around Buddhist communities for a very long time that I've come to the conclusion that that very extreme pure view, I see its benefit, but its danger outweighs its benefit a lot of the time. You know, in the association, it's remind me the uh, the attitude for the guru, like the attitude to the nature, you know, you know, to accept what is coming. One day it's raining, it's storming. Or... Yeah. Like, to accept everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is like that. And in a way, that's kind of the training, is to see... You know, you start with the, the real relationship and then you expand it into trying to see the guru in everything. The guru is teaching me through my kettle not working. The guru is teaching me by my roof leaking. The guru is teaching me by my garden looking beautiful and full of flowers. And that all of this is manifestations of the guru to teach me. So you start with that um, immediate human dynamic and then you expand it out similarly that everything that is happening must be a teaching for me. The way in which you do that, you know, it's a subtle thing worth a lot of thought, but it, it does become that, as you said, like acceptance of what is, um, and more than acceptance, uh, how is it a training? So you can decide to make things a training, whether they are meant that way or not, or you can think that they are meant as a training, right? And really, it's a personality issue and a stylistic issue, but, um, you know, there's a people of other traditions who like to say that everything is God's plan, right? It's a similar kind of idea. Everything is God's plan. Is everything God's plan? Well, you have to ask, you know, the scholars of those traditions if they pervasively accept that is true all the time. You know, it's a kind of a simplistic branding of a certain, say, form of Christianity um, to say war is God's plan, paradise is God's plan, everything is God's plan, blah, blah, right? And then you talk to the scholars and you realize that there is fine print, <laughs> right, of what that actually means and how that actually manifests in daily life and how they view it. So um, in Buddhism, we talk about having the pure view of everything, but how that actually functions becomes a little bit complicated <laughs> and worth, you know, sitting very deeply with. Yeah. Because it would be easy to sugarcoat things and it would be easy to do spiritual bypassing and it would be easy to disassociate from pain pretending that it's something 
more than it is or deeper than it is. And yet there is power in thinking that there is a learning here and there is a training here meant for me. Do you see the razor's edge? So, you know, the, the way to avoid fundamentalism is just to keep asking questions of yourself and to keep asking questions of your process. And if you keep coming to the same conclusions, it's fine. But I think if we keep a really active spirit of inquiry and questioning and debating, then we're less likely to fall into the trap of fundamentalism. Yeah, and if we meet with superior logic and superior wisdom, we adjust our view just as His Holiness always says about our view with science, if they have a better view about something or contradict something we've always believed, then we adjust our thinking and go with science if they have superior logic. Yeah, it's tricky, but some of these things go beyond logic and they're more in the, the realm of experience. So that's difficult as well. So the type of questioning you do internally might not always be a logical question. It might be an experiential question as well. What actually helps you touch the divine spark whatever that is yeah i wanted to ask something yeah what um, uh, he was also saying about uh how everything is a teaching in a way that you can really look at it as a way of learning from everything and everything that happens to you teaches us something or tells us something at the same time you keep on saying that trusting the guru is um you have to be careful debate you have to think there's something a little bit uh, hard to hold on to both ways, or maybe it isn't true. Maybe you, you're not supposed to in a way. Or something happens in the relationship. I don't know. I'm kind of like. Yeah, thinking out loud. There, yeah. Is there room for like um, disappointment or what happens when you feel the goal isn't? You can say everything is a teaching or you can say something is not going right. <laughs> yeah, and it could be something is not going right, and that is the teaching. <laughs> but if you jump over, that's the danger, right? If you pretend that everything is fine when it's not fine, and you kind of go, it's a teaching, it's a teaching, it's a teaching, that's the danger. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, very much what you're saying is the process we need to go through and just stop and go, I'm feeling disappointment. This is not what I expected. This is not what I promised. This is not what I gave myself to. Something different is happening than what I thought. I'm disappointed, I'm disillusioned. And that is the next teaching. Whether it's a teaching that was given from me, to me or it's a teaching that I'm taking from it, mm -hmm. that is the question. Yeah, is a teaching being given or are we taking a teaching from it? And it's probably somewhere in between, you know, or both. But to jump into one or the other, um, you know, it can make us rigid. We have to keep this really flexible mind that doesn't go disassociative and doesn't go overly plastic sugar coating things, but also doesn't revert into cynicism. You know, it's, and it's really delicate. Maybe similarly to the self uh, psycho psychology, uh, maybe minor uh, disappointments can help to, to build to build it, uh, the inner goal, uh, and especially if uh, 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 we are, uh, we also uh, intend to be a, a teacher ourselves. So, so we have to to check ourselves. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, disappointment can be the best thing to make us grow up, mm -hmm. because reliance on a teacher even in any sense, sutra, tantra, all the forms of tantra, reliance on a teacher is not so childish as we start out with. You know, in the beginning we think, now I've found the teacher, they're gonna hold my hand and take me to enlightenment. They aren't. Now I have a teacher, they're gonna learn all about my history and all my neuroses and all of my qualities and all of my family of origin issues. They don't care, right? Um, now I have a teacher, they're going to explicitly go through every detail of my practice exactly the way I want to hear it in the pace that I hope for. No, they're not. And those series of disappointments make you grow up and take responsibility for your own path. And then you shift into the accurate way, which is you request what you need, which means you need to sit with, what do I need? You know, but you request what you need because request creates the cause 
for the receptivity. Request creates the cause to get the stream that you're ready for. So, you know, in the beginning, we can be very childlike and sort of say, you know, daddy save me, mommy save me, or you're supposed to be the replacement for my partner or my husband, or you're supposed to be this or supposed to be that. They're not even really like a college or university mentor. It's a, it's a much different relationship. And um, that is good for us because it makes us take the reins of our own path. And yet we're not alone. We are completely held, completely supported, but in a very different way than the worldly samsaric way. This being is saying, I will hold you until the end of time. You know, I will support your path until all beings are free from cyclic existence. I will never give up on you. But that doesn't mean I'm going to spoon feed you every step of it, because that's not healthy for you either. So it's like to internalize the function and not the person. In... Yeah. Yeah, and you start, you know, you start with the person and then it does, yeah, become the function. Yeah. And then you start to engage with the, the guru-ness of any teacher. And if you meet a teacher that is an ordinary teacher who you know is ordinary, the training is to visualize your root guru on the crown of their head and imagine that they're talking through this ordinary person and you can still hear your teacher through this other vessel. You know, sometimes I go to a class with a, maybe a less experienced Geshe who's not used to Westerners yet, who may or may not have qualities, you know, but obviously is very well educated and more educated than me. And so I'll go to a class like that and they might teach in a very dry way, right? They might read from the text, explain the text, read from the text, explain the text, read from the text, explain the text. Very dry, no stories, no jokes, no personal experiences, just do, 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 right? And I could get annoyed, right? And I could get bored. Or I could imagine my teacher, Chodan Rinpoche, who passed away maybe five years ago. I could imagine him on the crown of this baby Geshe. And then I hear all of the wisdom of my teacher through the baby Geshe. And then it's a good experience. And then I'm engaged with the content and then I'm learning things and then everything is activated and awake, you know? And so this is, you know, in a way it's a, it's a mature way to engage with teaching. So you no longer seek to be entertained in order to be engaged, even though part of us still wants to be entertained. You're providing your own entertainment. I don't know. You're providing your own inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. That's not... What do you, like, maybe it's personal, but what do you do when your guru dies? Well, you know, it's, it is interesting. I mean, one of my greatest teachers did die and it kind of felt like when he was alive, I engaged with him in front of me in teachings and I thought about him in my practice but it was sort of confined to a certain form and a certain way of speaking and certain, you know, quirks of his personality. And then when he died, it felt like he was everywhere. You know, and I feel like I could hear him through every teacher. It doesn't mean his spirit was possessing every teacher. It doesn't mean everyone became a medium for him or something weird like that. It just meant that I, I was touching something deeper than his personality. I, was, I felt like I was teaching more the core of his wisdom which is a universal wisdom that you can access anywhere at any time. So it almost felt like I felt him more often, more close after he died. And then, you know, his reincarnation has been found and his reincarnation is, I don't know, four years old now and he's just a cute little boy. Um, and, you know, and I see this cute little boy and I'm like looking like, is it really you? Is it really you? Show me a sign. Is it really you? Do you remember that one time, you know, and I can feel myself sort of checking like, is this just a cute Tibetan tradition or is that really you in there? Like knock, 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 you know, and time will tell. But, um, you know, people who were students of Lama Yeshi tell very interesting stories about their relationship with Lama Osel, his reincarnation, who's now in his 30s, and um, completely different body, culture, language, and still somehow it's him. Yeah, it's interesting. Or not, me, right? Or not. Maybe they're just projecting that on this person and he's reinforcing it and it still works you know it, and, and yet you do believe that in the beginning it has to be a, a real person the guru it's not abstract or 
Yeah, I, I, it does, from the Buddhist perspective, it does have to be a real relationship with the real person to develop the pathways that open you up into touching the guru-ness in everything. But they say you can even think of like anyone who taught you anything as awakening that dynamic. It could be your, excuse me, it could be your kindergarten teacher who taught you the alphabet because the alph alphabet was the essential components for learning to read, for accessing knowledge. And that was the dynamic that awoke and stimulated the guru yoga ability within you. So, you know, so any, um, any teaching dynamic can be the ripener or the awakener. Um, I mean, Lama Zopa is very extreme and adorable. And he says, uh, even if it's a kangaroo, if it moves your mind towards the Dharma, you put them in the merit field and you see them as the guru, even if it's a kangaroo. <laughs> and you're like, really, Rinpoche? All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, basically, if it's a dynamic that moves your mind, yeah, that's the feeling, right? Whether you call it a cognitive shift or a developmental stage or whatever you're going to call it, but what is the dynamic that the other was an essential component for you shifting. Yeah, out of some sort of ignorance into some sort of wisdom. And the core of that is different than the personality of that, but the personality of that helped you engage with the core of it. Yeah, it's, it's tricky stuff, really. This is, you know, it's complicated and there's a lot of views on it. So, you know, you have to make up your own mind, but just kind of to know that this dynamic is, is a huge piece of our practice and how it might function in a secular way. It's an interesting conversation, but the reason we keep talking about it is that, you know, the guru disciple relationship is seen as the biggest condition for awakening your Buddha nature, which is the topic of this semester. So <laughs> that's why we're talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other sort of guru yoga ish questions before we um, shift? I feel like you need a, a, someone to support you throughout this process of finding someone to support you in this process <coughs> because it's so it's so complicated and so demanding and I don't know do, do you talk about it with your uh, colleagues friends uh, other uh, students yeah I mean that's the role of the sangha right that's the role of the Sangha, whether it's Sangha in the loose form of the community or it's Sangha in the specific form of monks and nuns or it's Sangha in the ultimate form, the Arya Bodhisattvas. You absolutely you need companions to help you check. Are you going crazy about this or not? Have you lost your reasonableness? Have you lost your objectivity? You know, absolutely. You need friends to talk to about this, but you have friends to talk to about this. Don't worry. You got plenty of friends. <laughs> so you're fine, you know, yeah, we're all fine. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a conversation we've been having a lot because a couple of uh, big gurus have just popped into the public view as being uh, misbehaving. And part of that is the nature of the refugee community. You know, when there's refugee communities, it's very easy for people with power to develop little like fiefdoms, like little kingdoms where they are the king and, you know, they develop the Dharma in the way that suits them and there's less accountability than there was in ancient Tibet. You know, in ancient Tibet, if there was a dodgy Lama, you know, who was a little bit dysfunctional, the other Lamas in the area could bring him into line and there was a lot more transparency and communication and checks and balances and which monastery did you come from? Who was your teacher, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that um, things are in the modern world and also we're, we're really relying on a refugee community has meant that the potential for dysfunctionality is more. It's just, you know, it's normal. So this conversation is something we talk about a huge amount. Um, what is the healthy way to relate? Yeah. It, it, it's so puzzling that they're still accepted as uh, teachers or as scholars or as uh, people who are going in, in, the, in this path because it would seem that by definition if you are advanced in this path you wouldn't want to behave non-ethically because you would understand that it, it, it um, leads to harm. You're um, delaying your own 
uh, awakening. So yeah, 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 you would think. <laughs> but the community uh, accept accepts them as uh, I mean, they're not they're not declared as a fraud or uh, I don't know. Uh, oh sure, yeah. Don't thanks. don't think that Buddhism's not that organized, right? It's not like there's this giant Buddhism head, right? There's a million forms of Buddhism, right? Each have their functional and dysfunctional tendencies, right? So um, when there's a dodgy guru, when there's a misbehaving guru, eventually that comes to light. Eventually there's a community eruption. Eventually they get kicked out, uh, you know, or it becomes a cult, right? They either get flicked out or the community, you know, closes their barriers and, be, you know, closes their borders and becomes even more dysfunctional and it becomes like a cult. So when something like this happens, um, there's either more health or more dysfunction just like anywhere else, right? Just because someone is a psychoanalyst, does it mean that they're um, mentally healthy? Just because they're teaching psychoanalysis, does it mean that they're mentally healthy and consistent with their behavior? Just because someone is a doctor, does it mean that they eat healthy? You know, that's the thing, right? Is that um, human beings are full of hypocrisy. And if you know that, you can avoid a lot of the pitfalls of that. But if you think you need to be perfect and then you realize that you're not, then that creates a defensiveness and a secrecy and a huge balagat, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, self-honesty is the key. Recognize your own hypocrisy is the key. And if you have a sinking feeling when you meet someone, sit with that a little bit. When I met Sogyal Rinpoche many years ago, I was so excited because I had read the Tibetan book of living and dying and I loved it. It was such a good book. It was so well written. It was an amazing book, right? And I was so excited. I'm finally going to meet Sogil Rinpoche. I've been reading this book since I was 12 years old. Oh, and he comes into the room and my heart just sank and I couldn't tell you why. Yeah. And he started to teach and he was um, brilliant. He was charismatic, but I had an icky feeling. Yeah, I was like, something is out of sync. Something is out of sync. And there was just little, you know, key little things that he would do or say that made me feel like he is not practicing as advanced as he's teaching. And he's not being honest with us about this. And I don't think he's my teacher. And then, you know, years later, I feel very grateful that I listened to that because my life would be a lot more complicated. But that's not to say that the organization Rigpa that he was the inspiration for isn't an amazing organization. It is. It's great. And they're dealing with this trauma. They're, you know, changing their ethical policies and they're examining this and that. And, you know, it was a huge mess and totally painful, but they're, you know, they're recovering and their beautiful hospices and their beautiful Dharma centers and retreat centers are starting to patch themselves back together. And no doubt there's a lot of people who are in denial and a lot of people who are heartbroken, but I mean, that is life and humanity, right? Anytime you find an organization, there's going to be dysfunction and hypocrisy, you know, so it's not going to be different on the spiritual path just because it's spiritual because human beings have afflictions, right? Not because the path is faulty, but practitioners are, right? Yeah. So it's just, you know, a healthy, healthy skepticism, without it becoming cynicism, an openness without being naive. Yeah. Slowly, slowly. But right now, don't worry, you know, maybe some of you have a guru, but most of you just have, you know, friendly nuns who teach you things and you can argue with us and think of us however you want and it's not fraught or complicated and no, um, no uh, commitment has been made, no marriage has been established, so do what you like. <laughs> with the people who teach you Dharma, it doesn't matter. Just, you know, try and penetrate the truth through whatever source is telling it to you. Yeah. I hope no one is disillusioned. No, you're fine. Everybody okay? Or it's healthy disillusionment. You're like, oh, all right, I thought that might be the case. Glad to hear it. Right. I mean, you know, I guess it's, it's this thing of, if we remember what has happened to the Catholic Church as the result of you know, uh, lying, basically, you know, there's the abuse, and then there's the lying about the abuse, what tore apart the religion was the lying more than the abuse. The abuse was horrible. But if the victims had been taken care of, if the perpetrators had been addressed, the Catholic Church might have survived in a better way than it has, 
right? So I think that the lesson here is for any organization, including human spirit, including the association, including any group that you're ever a part of, is to not shy away from truth and discussing it, as long as there's compassion at the core of it. Yeah, because any group of people it could get dysfunctional quite easily. Right? Yeah, so anyway, we just keep our wisdom woken up together with compassion. Should be right, right? As good as it gets for samsara, right? Because if you're seeking perfection in samsara, you'll be constantly disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nobody's depressed. All right, we're going to move on. <laughs> right. Okay, so turning to um, this book, page 37, we're going to look at these nine analogies for Buddha nature. Okay. So it, um, I'm just going to read it to you slowly so that we can sit with it. But basically, um, skipping the first sentence, the second sentence says, the 18 analogies and their meanings as described in Maitreya's sublime continuum emphasize that the stains are not an integral part of our minds. Right? Like highlight, highlight, highlight. Right? The stains are not an integral part of our minds. These analogies explain that which conceals and what is concealed and demonstrate that it is possible to attain the nature body of a Buddha free from the two kinds of obscurations or obstructions. So the nature body is one of the dharmakayas, right, born from the wisdom side of the path. Free of the two obscurations, um, the obscurations to omniscience and the afflictive obscurations. Yeah, we talked about it briefly when we did basis, path, and result. So the point here is some poetry, right? We got some poetry coming up. We got some analogies coming up. And what you're just trying to touch is there can be a mess. There can be stains. There can be obscurations. There can be afflictions. There can be suffering. And that does not negate the fact that Buddhahood is possible and will always be possible. That does not override the fact that the core of you is perfect and pure and always transformable. Yeah, that the mind can always be developed is not contradicted by the fact that there's a big mess right now. Okay, and so there's just different ways of looking at it and it's, it's just very kind of poetic and see how you sit with it. But basically, nine of the analogies and what they illustrate are associated with the afflicted side the other nine and what they signify are associated with the purified side. Okay, those associated with the afflicted side are as follows. An ugly lotus, latent desire. A swarm of bees, latent anger. The husk, latent ignorance. A heap of filth, the three poisonous emotions manifesting strongly. Earth, the stage of the imprints of ignorance the seeds, objects to be eliminated by the path of seeing, rags, objects to be eliminated by the path of meditation, the womb, objects to be eliminated on the seven impure bodhisattva stages, nine, a mold, objects to be eliminated on the eighth, ninth, and tenth bodhisattva stages. So this is talking about grounds and paths. Yeah, those last few. So then um, their other side, the following nine, are something precious which is hidden. The Buddha, the truth body of realization. Honey, the truth body of teachings on the ultimate, namely on things as they are. Rice, the truth body of teachings on the conventional, namely the multiplicity of things. Gold, suchness. A treasure. The innately abiding disposition, a tree, the developmental disposition, 
Those two refer to the two aspects of Buddha nature, that which is naturally present and that which needs to be developed, right? 16, a precious statue, the potential for the truth body, Dharmakaya. A future universal monarch, the potential for the enjoyment body, Symbogakaya. A statue, the potential for the emanation body, Nirmanakaya. Okay, so that's just the premise and then it gets unpacked. Those gone to bliss have seen the disposition for enlightenment in all living beings, even those in the lowest hell. For that reason, they have taught us how to remove the disturbing attitudes and emotions and everything which conceals this disposition. When these factors have been removed, it will become the truth body, right? So there's the truth body that will happen just from the removal of stains, but we're not done yet. In the analogy, is that which conceals and what is concealed are all different. Regarding what these analogies illustrate, the concealing factors such as latent desire and so forth are in each case different, but what they conceal is the essence of those gone to bliss, meaning Buddhas, which can be subsumed as the truth body, suchness, and the disposition. All the concealing factors hide these three, right? The truth body reaches living beings through enlightened activity, which they all have the potential to receive, right? So highlight, 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 yeah? The truth body reaches living beings through enlightened activity, which they all have the potential to receive, right? So all sentient beings can receive the blessings, the connection, the enlightened activity of the Buddha. The main way in which this happens is in the form of teachings. The first three analogies for what is hidden, a Buddha, honey, and rice, illustrate that Buddha nature is the potential to receive the enlightened activity of the truth body. Okay, so we're gonna unpack this a little bit and I'll just read through them slowly and then I'll make you an analytical meditation that goes with it. It just takes a minute to wrap your head around what's happening here in these analogies. But once we get to the end of it, it should make some sense. So just, you know, read along slowly and sit with it, okay? All right. The ugly misshapen lotus symbolizes latent desire. Latent desire becomes manifest. When it first arises, we feel joyful, but soon there is pain. One who has the clear divine eye, meaning clairvoyance, can see hidden within the ugly lotus the form of a Buddha adorned with the 32 major and 80 minor signs of enlightenment. When the petals are removed, this form is revealed. It symbolizes the truth body, which only the form of an enlightened one can represent in this world. The sphere of phenomena is pure by nature of all stains of true existence. In the state of enlightenment, there is also complete purity or absence of all temporary stains. An enlightened being never again arises from the state of directly perceiving the sphere of phenomena, possessing these two kinds of purity. This direct perception of an enlightened being is called the truth body of realization. It is not accessible to those who are not enlightened, right? It can't be seen by people who aren't enlightened. For this reason, Buddhas manifest different form bodies, an enjoyment body for those who are already exalted beings, meaning Arya beings who have realized emptiness directly, and for others, an emanation body, which is the source of the scriptures. These form bodies are not as coarse as our own. Hundreds of bees representing anger surround the honey. Whoever wants to get at the honey must first remove the swarm of bees. The great sage, the enlightened one, saw that this honey-like Buddha nature, the innately abiding disposition, is present in all living beings, and when freed from stains, it becomes the nature body of an enlightened being. For this reason, there are the wisdom, truth, bodies, teachings on emptiness, the ultimate. The scriptures are the effect which accords with the cause, namely an enlightened one's direct perception of the reality of his or whole mind. It's empty of inherent existence. <clears throat> These scriptures consist of both definitive sutras or discourses which explain the ultimate and interpretable discourses which explain the conventional. 
When emptiness is perceived directly, it always produces bliss of the same taste, just as honey is always sweet. The husk denotes ignorance and the grain within, the wisdom truth's body's teachings on conventional reality. Just as conventional reality is manifold, so too are the teachings on it. This is represented by the many forms of grain, each with a husk. If we want to cook the grain to make a meal, we must first husk it, right? Take off the outer covering. The rotting heap of filth signifies the disturbing emotions when they are strongly active. We dislike touching filth and find it disgusting. The disturbing emotions produce disgusting actions that are like filth and keep us mired in cyclic existence. If the disturbing emotions do not exist in latent form, they could not manifest in this way. The actions they produce shackle us to the three realms of existence, desire, form, and formless. Those that come from anger are always non-virtuous and lead to bad rebirths. Actions occasioned by desire and attachment or ignorance may constitute contaminated virtue and can lead to rebirth in the form and formless realms. For instance, attachment to the pleasure experienced during meditative stabilization or to the blissful peace of absorption may lead to a rebirth in the form and formless realms. Right? So if you get attached to your own meditation without remembering bodhicitta and renunciation, then you take rebirth in one of these former formless realms where you can't help anyone and you just strain your merit. But it's fun while it lasts. Okay. However, these are undesirable rebirths because while enjoying that bliss, one creates no new merit. And when previous merit is exhausted, one must once more take birth in a lower state of existence. This kind of attachment is afflicted but unspecified and not non-virtuous because non-virtue will never lead to such a rebirth. Unspecified here means that it is not indicated in the scriptures as virtuous or non-virtuous, yet it is afflicted because attachment is a disturbing emotion, even if not strongly active within the peaceful states of absorption of the upper realms. So this unspecified um, is a little bit of what you were talking about in Minds and Mental Factors with SK. Venerable SK. A celestial being flying in the sky through clairvoyant powers sees a beautiful piece of gold jewelry that once belonged to a human. It fell to the ground many years before, and though it is covered by layers of dirt, the gold has remained unaltered. If the celestial being points out to a human where the golden object lies, that human being will be able to uncover it. Similarly, the enlightened ones see the suchness of our minds meaning emptiness, our innately abiding disposition, which is covered by the filth of our disturbing emotions. It is there, unaltered, just like a piece of precious jewelry caked in dirt. They send a shower of the ambrosial teachings to wash away the filth. Just as the gold remains unchanged and is not stained by the surrounding dirt, but can bring happiness if worn and riches if sold, so the suchness of our mind never changes nor is it affected by our emotions, right? The emptiness of your mind is permanent. It can lead us to lasting happiness through understanding the suchness of our minds and then familiarizing ourselves with it. We will attain the nature body of a Buddha. These first four analogies for what which conceals are mainly about the disturbing emotions as they manifest in ordinary people. And they primarily stress the noxious and obstructive nature of these disturbing emotions. If we can get rid of them, everything else will come right. It is the task of an enlightened being to show us how to do it, but we must put what is taught into practice in order to experience the results. The first four analogies for that which is concealed the Buddha, the honey, and the rice represent the truth body, while the gold represents suchness. The fifth analogy of earth, which hides the treasure. This is not a treasure of artifacts which has been buried, but ore or precious stones which are naturally present in the ground. A beggar's hovel is built on this patch of land, which hides an inestimable treasure, an inexhaustible treasure. The beggar knows nothing of the treasure's presence, 
and the treasure does not announce itself. The earth represents the stage of the imprints of ignorance. If a clairvoyant sees the treasure underground and tells the beggar, he can, over, he can uncover it and be free of poverty. But until that time, he will remain poor. The naturally present treasure represents our innately abiding disposition, which is the source of many good qualities. In this, it is as a treasure which, when mined, yields much gold or many jewels. We suffer from poverty of good qualities, such as the seven riches possessed by the exalted one. Through the Buddha's teachings on the two aspects of selflessness, we will come to see the fundamental nature of things directly and will possess the qualities of the exalted. This will enable us to gain freedom from cyclic existence. We, could, we should consider what we can learn from these examples. The sixth example of the seed, which contains the potential for a fully grown tree laden with fruit, demonstrates how our disposition for enlightenment can become the nature body of a Buddha. By creating virtue, we will eventually remove the stains and become a king of subduers, a fully enlightened Buddha. Just as the seed germinates when the right conditions of moisture, a fertile growing medium, and the conducive temperature are present, Similarly, our developmental disposition is activated through hearing, thinking, and meditating. When supported by the spirit of enlightenment, bodhicitta, it will bear the fruit of Buddhahood. The seed represents everything that is eliminated by the Hinayana path of seeing, the foundational vehicle, realization of emptiness. Those thus gone see the disposition for enlightenment even in the most humble living creatures and teach us how to remove the stains. If we practice, this precious potential will, lead its, will yield its fruit. In the seventh example, a gold statue wrapped in rags lies by the road, and everyone walks past it without even realizing it's there. A celestial being with clairvoyant power sees it within the rags and alerts one of the passerbys to its presence. The rags represent everything that is eliminated by the Hinayana path of meditation. The statue made of something precious denotes the nature body. The precious material is not an artificial alloy that has been manufactured by combining various materials involving numerous causes and conditions. It is a natural material of great value. Similarly, the nature body is not constructed by causes and conditions. Through its presence, the wishes of living beings can be fulfilled spontaneously. This analogy can be taken as a statue that has appeared of its own accord in the precious metal material. The statue has not come into being through coarse causes and conditions, such as the work of an artisan, but has come into being naturally. The enlightened ones see the precious dispositions in impure living beings, concealed within all the mental defilements, and know that when these temporary defilements are removed, enlightenment will follow. When we accomplish the nature body of enlightenment, we become the true protectors of others. The eighth example, a destitute and ugly young woman carries in her womb the future universal monarch. At present, she suffers and thinks her pregnancy is a calamity, not knowing that through the child in her womb, she will attain status and power and that he will become her protector. The universal monarch symbolizes the enjoyment body. Just as a universal monarch enjoys power over several continents, the enjoyment body has dominion over and makes use of all the great teachings of the great vehicle. The destitute woman represents everything that is eliminated on the seven impure bodhisattva stages. Buddhas see the clear light nature of our disposition and know that it has source of preciousness. When the temporary stains have been removed, we will become exalted Buddhas. The clay mold hides the golden statue within it. The mold symbolizes everything that is eliminated on the pure bodhisattva stages. The statue represents the emanation body of an enlightened being. It is made of gold, which can be turned into many different things. The emanation body's nature is exalted wisdom, which takes whatever forms will be of benefit to living beings. Earlier, when describing the mind's suchness, we said that it remains unchanged, whatever the circumstances, that it is unaffected by mental stains and is a source of prosperity. We may wonder how such the suchness of the mind or the innately abiding disposition 
which is after all just the non-affirming negation of true existence, can be a source of great qualities and happiness. When we focus our minds on emptiness, we create virtue and store of insight. Virtue leads to happiness and the store of insight along with the store of merit are the causes of enlightenment. Highlight that section, very important. The stores of merit and the stores of insight are also called um, the accumulations of merit and the accumulations of wisdom. Reference to suchness of the mind with stains emphasizes the identity of that emptiness, while mention of the innately abiding disposition emphasizes its function. Because emptiness is a non-product in that it is not produced by causes and conditions and does not produce anything else, the causal aspect here refers to the fact that emptiness is like a substratum and like space within which everything arises. It does not cause those things, but allows them to come into being and to operate. So just sitting with that, right? That everything is empty because it dependently arises, but for permanent things, they don't depend on causes and conditions. They just depend upon parts, upon a basis of designation and the mind's imputation but not causes and conditions. That's only for impermanent phenomena. Okay, so let's see, we have to finish. So if you can read page 43, um, page 43 to 46, I know that it's a bit wordy and it's a bit um, clunky language, but it's, it's something interesting to sit with because a lot of our doubts boil down to a disbelief that perfection is possible and an over-identification with stains. So we can talk about the logic of it and we can talk about the ideas around it, but sometimes a bit of poetry and a bit of experiential ideas and kind of touching it in a different way can bring out a different level of understanding. So if you can read the rest of that chapter before Monday, that would be great. And um, we'll just take a minute and dedicate. We connect. Through hearing, contemplating, and meditating, may our mind develop into an awakened state that is of benefit to both oneself and others. Okay, thanks guys.